I'm Ryan Crabb, we're at Steamboat Lake State Park, and I'm gonna go over some preventative maintenance on the snowmobile. Some quick and easy tips that'll save you a lot of money and maybe some walking down the trail. So to start with, we're gonna go over just some easy things that we want you to look at, especially since we share snowmobiles, we wanna be able to go over um, things you need to look at before you go out on a ride. So part of your pre-ride inspection. It's easiest to do this with the snowmobile flipped on its side. Make sure you put something on the back side so it's not gonna scratch it up. Um, so on the skis, this is the skag, this piece of metal here, and then there's this little four inch chunk of carbide that's inset within the skag. We wanna make sure that these are in, both in good condition. The carbide isn't really as important as the skag. This is just gonna, this gives you, um, better steering control when you're on ice or asphalt. Um, the skag is what's gonna give you your steering when you're in the snow. So we wanna make sure that the most important part is the skag's in good condition. It'll start to wear out right here. And once it wears, our, wears out, you will start to get into your ski. So to replace these, it's four bolts. And they're about 50 bucks a set. But then if you don't, pay attention to these, you're gonna end up having to replace your ski, which you're looking at a couple hundred bucks. So that's the first easy thing you wanna look at. And also when it's on its side, you wanna look down your machine and make sure that the suspension is all straight, your A-arms aren't tweaked. If they're painted, it's pretty easy to tell if they've got a small impact on them because that paint will start to um, crack at that point. And your A-arm's toast, you need to replace it anyway because it's gonna fail on you at some point. Another thing you wanna look at is make sure that your shock is still centered within your A-arms because that would let you know if your whole one side or the other is pushed in. Moving along, now back into your track and your rear suspension. Um, really important piece to keep in mind is the high fax. The high fax is this piece right here that, separate, that um, protects your track from wearing out your rails, so these long aluminum rails. So it's this black piece of plastic right here. It varies in colors depending on the snowmobile, but we're looking at this black piece of plastic. This is your Hyfax, one on each rail. Here's the rail, this big aluminum piece right here. So what this does is this is a part that protects these metal clips which are on the track from rubbing directly on the aluminum rail, because if they do, then it'll wear out your rail. So see these metal clips right here that are on the track? If, if there wasn't the high fax right here, these clips would run directly on this aluminum rail and the metal and the aluminum um, don't get along real well when it's hot and the metal clips will wear out this aluminum rail. So what we're looking for when we are looking at the high fax is this line right here. This line right here is basically like your wear bar on your tires. When you start seeing this, that it's getting close to that line, it's time to replace your high fax. If you don't, then these clips will get on your rail and it's gonna wear into your rail. And if you let it wear in your rail for very long, it's gonna ruin your rail. So these are, again, a super cheap part. It's about 40 or 50 bucks for a set of them and it's easy to take off. You just loosen your track, there's one screw holding them on, you slide them off the back, and then um, you can put the new ones on. So if you don't spend the $50 um, and the half an hour or an hour's worth of time to replace these when they need to be, you're gonna start wearing into your rails and it's gonna start costing your pocketbook a lot more. These rails are gonna be a couple hundred dollars, plus you have to drop the entire suspension out to replace a rail. So if you do it yourself, you're looking at a, at least a half of a day. Um, if you take it into the shop, you're probably looking at five, six hundred dollars worth of parts and labor to replace a rail. So spend the 50 bucks and take the five seconds and look and see if you're starting to get it into your wear bars or your wear line. Uh, and it can't, and it's not gonna be consistent. It's gonna be in between, lots of times you're gonna, in between your wheels, if you've got idler wheels along here, or 
it's just gonna be up in your approach angles. So it's gonna be inconsistent, kind of wavy, where you're gonna get those wear, those wear, wear bars um, wearing out. And if you get into that anywhere in the rail, even if it's just a small spot, you need to replace the whole Hyfax. A way to keep your Hyfax in good shape so you don't have to deal with replacing them is to have these scratchers on and use them and don't use them in reverse because they'll break off. But keep those scratchers on and down. What that's gonna do is gonna keep the snow sliding up into your track and helping lubricate those high facts so that they're not gonna get too hot and wear out. These things are also great because they're gonna keep snow rotating through or circulating through the track. So the track can kick them up into your heat exchangers and keep your sled from overheating. If you don't use your high facts you're gonna, or your scratchers, you're gonna wear out your high facts and you're gonna overheat your sled. Okay, and the last part to look for for real basic maintenance in your rear suspension is just to make sure you keep your grease zerks greased. There's only a handful of them, about five or six in the rear suspensions of most sleds nowadays. Um, and so you just need to hit them with grease every once in a while. So at least in the spring, you need to put enough grease in there to where you're forcing any water out. If you see water coming out, just keep putting grease in until you don't see any water coming out. And then I like to do it again in the fall, just as a double check. So here's a grease zerk, another one below it. And there's more up there in the front suspension, front of the rear suspension. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna look at is your chain case. Uh, this is another one of those expensive parts that you can save having to replace and having to walk a long distance by just doing a small amount of maintenance on it. Um, the easiest way to get to your chain case is to actually pull the can out. You can work on it without it in there, especially on these newer models where the whole side panel comes off. Uh, I just find it's a little easier and I can feel more confident in the job that I've done um, if I remove the can. So I use a spring puller. A lot of times you can try using a uh, vice grips, but you're going to bloody your knuckles. So this $10 tool works great, makes it super fast. You'll spend a half an hour trying to get the springs off with, a, with vice grips or if you notch a, uh, a flathead screwdriver. But with the spring puller, it takes a minute to pull off the springs, which I've already done. And you can just remove the can. It gives you a lot of room to work. And so right here's your chain case, this black, black plate right there. And here's your chain tension bolt right here. So what this is, is this is an aluminum case that's got a metal chain in it and metal gears. And so if, if you get too much slack in your chain by not paying attention to this tension bolt, it'll start slapping around in there and eventually it'll slap the side of your chain case hard enough that it's gonna blow a hole in it. And once that happens, the sled is dead right there. You're gonna be towing it back. Okay, so to adjust the chain case, we're just gonna take a couple of wrenches and we need to loosen up this jam nut right here. Doing this backwards. Loosen up that jam nut and then this is all done finger tight on the tension bolt. So you screw in the tensioner. Until it's finger tight. And not like Hulk finger tight, just normal guy finger tight. And then back it out about a half of a turn. Quarter to a half turn. While you, hold the, while you hold the tension bolt in place, you wanna tighten that jam nut back up. And you're done with the checking the tension. The other thing you wanna check while you're in here is 
the chain case fluid. Um, some models have a viewing window down here in the bottom portion of the chain case, which is super easy to check. You want to just look into there and it needs to be about the halfway point on that viewing window. And if Polaris chain case oil is blue. So if you look in that window and it's the halfway point and it's black or brown, it's time to change your chain case oil, which is easy to do. Um, some other models have the fill hole is the same place where you check to see what the level's at. And so on this one, it does it's the fill hole is the one we would have to check. So we would just loosen up the fill hole nut, which is on the back side, which is a hex. Just loosen that up and you just want to see it up into the threads. If it's, you see it in the threads, you're good to go. If you don't see it in the threads, you need to add some chain case fluid. And that's it. That's how you make your chain case not blow up on you while you're on the trail. Another piece of um, preventive maintenance we're going to look at is your clutch. Um, your drive clutch and your driven clutch. This is your primary. So what we want to look at in these is you want to make sure that the weights, which are right here, are centered in the roller, which is right in there. And there's on these Polaris's, there's three of them. And then you also want to look at the spring down in here, make sure it's not broken. You need to have these rebuilt about every 1,200 miles or so. Um, they're not too awful expensive to have rebuilt, but this is just another one of those parts that if you let this go, your machine's going to run terrible and you know you can do some severe damage or have to buy a whole new clutch. All right, now let's work on changing the belt on a Polaris. So one extremely important thing to remember while you're changing a belt is because these machines are equipped with reverse, if you try to change a belt while it's in reverse, like I did once, and you really torque on this me um, metal key inside of aluminum clutch, you will ruin your secondary clutch and have to buy the boss a brand new clutch for his brand new snowmobile. So make sure that you're not in reverse and just don't cycle the button back to forward. Make sure that it creeps forward a little bit because when it's in reverse, it locks this clutch closed and so you can't spread it. Um, so yeah, note to sell from my experience and failure is to make sure you're not in reverse when you go to change a belt. So to give you a key, you screw that key in. And what that's doing is as you're screwing this key in, it's spreading your clutch apart so that your, drill, your belt can loosen and drop into there so you can easily get it off. The reason you'd be doing this is if you have had a belt problem, like you drove with your parking brake on, or it blew up, or you're just wanting to ins inspect the belt, or you're taking it off for the season. Um, I don't recommend leaving them on while you storm over the summer. So you pull your belt off and you want to look at it and look for any obvious signs of wear. Um, I look for a polished spot that would be kind of in a semicircle on here. That would be where you had your brake on and you hit the gas. Look for any strings coming out of it or any of, the, any of these teeth missing and this belt's in good shape. The other thing you want to do is make sure that when you put it back on, you put it back on so you can read the, um, the writing on it. It's facing out towards you. Um, so this belt's in good shape, no cracks. You also want to hyperextend it a little bit there and see if you see cracks throughout. So this belt's in good shape. This is another thing that you want to pay attention to. These things are getting pretty pricey. They're about 180 bucks nowadays, 200 bucks. Um, but if you run with a chunky belt, it's going to mess up your clutches. So again, it's going to be something where if you take care of this wearable part, it's going to save these parts that um, cost significantly more. So put it back on, same thing, put it where I can read it. Roll it onto the secondary, or the primary, and then stick it on the secondary here. And then as you loosen, 
you want to keep working the belt back up because otherwise if you just if you were just to screw this thing out um, it would close it, the belt would be all the way down in the bottom so you're when you hit the gas your clutch would slap down on there and it would scar your belt in one spot and that's going to be a potentially fail point later on so you want to keep working it around as you loosen it up And you want it to be set just a little bit above the top of this secondary back here, um, so you can see you can see the grooves and the and the ribs sticking out of the belt over the top. That's about where you want it. You can see they're sticking out over the top of the clutch, the secondary clutch, and that's how to change the belt. <laughs>